Uh, so my name is Josh Phillips. I have a surprise guest who did not show up in the schedule. His name is Michael Donnelly. I'll let him, you know, introduce himself in a little bit. Uh, I don't know what it is, but generally I always get the last slot at the conferences I speak at, and so hopefully I don't, uh, you know, tell everybody, uh, you know, too much of a tiring lullaby. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, there is somebody after us, and I feel really bad for him, but, you know. What, what are you going to do? So, let me see if I can change. Hmm. Okay, there we go. And, okay, that's the right slide. S stuff's not working for me. Uh, I've heard that, uh, that all the presenters have ha been having really bad luck today. Like, no demos are working and, you know, stuff like that. So, hopefully, we do. yeah, hopefully ours will go better. So, about me, uh, in real life, I play a, a malware researcher at Kaspersky. I was also a mal malware analyst at Microsoft. And uh, contrary to pop popular opinion, or what you may find on uh, Wikipedia, uh, Configure was not uh, German and Dutch slang for ass fucker. It was just a play on, on words that I managed to, you know, to come up with. That was my uh, like, biggest achievement in life so far. Uh, yeah. Underground, uh, you know, I was a gold farmer, wrote some bots for some games that people might have heard of, but I won't, I'll let people guess as to what that is because I know what Blizzard does to people. Uh, I'll let Mike talk about himself right now. <laughs> All right, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Donnelly, otherwise known as Mercury. Uh, I created the glider software for World of Warcraft, sold about $4 million worth of the software, got sued, uh, lost... I think it even says right on there, badly. Um, lost the tune of six and a half million dollars in damages, personally liable. Uh, appealed it, got most of it flipped over. But overall the process was, I would say, less than fun. Uh, as far as my underground identity, I have none. Once you get sued, everything about you winds up in court record, all your deposition, all your addresses, everything. But uh, on the plus side, I did have a Glider customer bring beer to my house. He had looked me up. And dropped the beer off, and then he posted a message on the glider forms and said, hey, Mercury, go check outside your front door. There's a six-pack of beer. That yeah, was pretty nice. And, and there actually was the beer. I, I go in through the garage, so I didn't see it, and I went out and got it. And it was only Budweiser, but free beer is free beer. Yeah, so not, not that great. Uh, if you're going to get smoked for $6.5 million, at least I got some free beer. Oh, and um, I guess all two of you ladies here, he's single, <laughs> and he used to be rich. Yeah, okay, I, ahead, I am married, but yeah, so I'm not so lucky. So our goal of this talk is to not make anybody like an expert at game hacking. So if you came here for that, then we're going to disappoint you. Uh, we, uh, you know, we plan on just giving you know some overview. If you if you don't have any like technical skills, we assume you have some to get you know at least something out of this talk. But if you don't have technical skills, we hope that you know some of our game hacking war games. Are you know will be entertaining for you guys. Uh, something I will say is we don't really have any zero days. So if you're looking for zero days, then you're also going to be uh, disappointed. But we don't really feel we need to give any zero days because you know it's really easy to find them. You know every game that's ever released is going to have you know a buttload of stuff. So uh, so here's a uh, a nice quote from Sun Tzu, and I think Mike has some experience with this. No. He actually chose to fight. He's actually the only person I know that actually did choose to fight, and I guess you can ask him about how that's going. Nah, it's, it could be better. Could, could be better. Could yes. be worse. Yeah, could be. So here's a brief legal blurb that Mike has experience with, and he's going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And w one thing I wanted to say is, of course, everybody knows I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I can't give you any legal advice. Um, but I'm a person, and I can give you personal advice when it comes to lawyers, and when you get lawyers, you're fucked. <laughs> if it gets to that point, you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, chances are it's going to end badly. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people, such as myself, you might think, well, I've got a good legal theory for what to do. You know, I've got Section 117, owner of a copy, I've got DMCA 1201F, interoperability, you know, let's go, man, you, you can't take me down. Uh, 
it's incredibly painful and expensive to get that far. So even if you have winning arguments, the chances that you get there are slim. I'm not saying you should never do anything where you might get sued. I'm saying you need to understand the seriousness of getting sued. Um, it's bad. So you should take steps to avoid it. If you have to sell from Nevis or uh, Neptune or the seventh dimension, try to get away to avoid getting sued. Uh, because the game companies, if you piss them off, they will show up at your door. China is a good place to be, though. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> I'm good. So my disclaimer is we're, we're weasels. Uh, I guess maybe I'm a weasel. Mike, uh, you know, chose to do everything in, in public. Uh, I think that might have been a poor choice. You guys can decide. Uh, so, you know, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. So why do we hack? Uh, I think it's mostly obvious. You know, we want some women's. And yeah, so did I, did I mention that Mike's single? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. So really, I mean, th there's a lot of money in this. Uh, you know, Mike made, you know, $4 million. Uh, my first competitor was making half a million a month. That's pretty real money. Uh, you know, sometimes people might want revenge or cheating, but that's not really Kids important. being kids. Yeah. Child, child play. So raise of hands, who would like to go to this school? I mean, I really wish that this was, you know, offered in my college, but it, it really wasn't. So uh, we're going to get through some tools of the trade. You know, if you don't know any of these, maybe you should start looking at them. So Ida, I think most reverse engineers can't live without it. It should be pretty obvious what you do with that. You disassemble some code. Ollie DBG. Let me go back. Ollie uh, debugger. If you don't know what a debugger is, then you probably shouldn't be here really either. Uh, you need a memory, something to search memory. Most people use something like Art Money or T Search, something like that. They're pretty popular. Uh, zero and zero editor. If you are doing anything with file formats, this is like God mode. Uh, I think that anybody doing it without zero and zero editor is, you know, failing. Uh, it also helps with uh, like packet captures if you want to, uh, you know, see what the uh, the structure of a, of a packet is. And something that's very important are your custom tools. And once you get serious about game hacking, if you don't have your own scripts for Ida to do all these sorts of magical things, then you are wasting your time. Yeah, I was going to say one thing I wanted to add is, is these are the tools that you're looking at if you're doing something professional. If you're going to build a big piece of software and sell it or run it or, you know, take this on as a business, um, you can do a lot with nothing. You can, you can duplicate items, you can find bugs in games just by being clever and tinkering. So uh, this is, you know, what, I don't know, ProGrade or, or what you would use to make money. But uh, part of the panel is hacking for fun, so I'm not going to completely focus on profit. Yeah, there's nothing worse than, than coding up a bot with a bunch of hard-coded offsets and then, you know, the game releases an update and your stuff doesn't work again and then you have to start from pretty much ground zero. That's where your tools come in. Uh, so I've got a, a bit of classification. Uh, basically, like some, some, there's like cheats, bots. I'm not going to go into really detail about the stuff. I'll talk to, talk more detail about it when, when the stuff comes up uh, later on. Uh, you know, there's some really, I guess, motivated individuals have written, you know, custom clients. Uh, one of my competitors in China wrote a custom client for World of Warcraft and pretty much destroyed us. Uh, you know, they could run hundreds of clients per computer and it's really hard to compete, uh, compete with that when you can run like three or four. What about the, uh, there's one custom client that in particular is funny. Um, just by, by raising hands, how many people here have played the game Hellgate London? Okay, how many people that have played it were playing it six months later? One? I, I, okay. I feel sorry for the people who yeah, played yeah. it. Well, the reason I, I mention that is I know a guy that, that works with World of Warcraft, German guy, and he got, the game, he got the Hellgate London beta and he thought it was awesome. So he wrote a clientless bot. He, he reverse engineered the entire protocol, everything, their key shake or their, uh, their handshake, all the encryption. He had it ready for game at launch time and then thousands of hours. Yeah, gone. he's like, man, this is, this is going to be the next <laughs> this wow. This is going to be the next wow, yeah. So, you know, if you're writing something for profit, 
Think of it like a business. Don't be stupid. Yeah, that was a lot of waste of time. Uh, then there's things like exploits. Uh, they can either be malicious or really get you a giant paycheck. Uh, dupes are, you know, god mode. Uh, asset hacks aren't really worth it for the most part. You know, you can do some like pathfinding if you can reverse engineer the, the you know, map format and, and um, uh, what uh, other assets. But pathfinding is super hard unless you're going to do something like use recast navigation, which is easy mode for solving a really, really tough problem. So this is where we separate the, the haves from the have nots. People might not be able to follow. Hopefully they can follow. So the skill set that you need, you're probably going to want to at least know x86 assembly. If you don't know that, then you've got a lot to learn. That's going to be a pretty big, uh, steep road ahead for you. Uh, this stuff isn't really uh, necessary. You can write some like lame pixel reading things. I think somebody presented at that a couple years ago here. It was pretty well attended and I wanted to punch the dudes because it wasn't very cool. Um, yeah, noobs need not apply. So, anybody know this guy? His name is uh, Rich Thurman. Uh, he was, I think, one of the first guys who actually came public as a gold farmer. This picture is from a, an IEEE article that they wrote about him in around 2000, 2001. He made a hundred, over $100,000. That's what he admits. I think he made a little bit more than that uh, just doing uh, some hacks for Ultima Online. Uh, basically, his tips were play with memory editing, locate key data structures, and profit. I guess it's up to you. You forgot the question marks in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So memory searching is an arcane art, but it's a skill that you definitely need. If you cannot master memory searching for, you know, finding things like hit points, et cetera, it's going to be really difficult to do some static analysis and, and find these things. So I mentioned some, some games here. Uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with World of Warcraft. Anybody not? Okay. I think everybody is. Uh, so they, they're one of the first games to actually use a, a commodity script engine. Most, uh, most games make the mistake of rolling their own. But they chose Lua. And one of the side effects of Lua is you have this string embedded in your binary that tells you the name of the function. So if you ever are reverse engineering code and you want to know, hey, how do I cast a spell in World of Warcraft? Well, you open up Ida and look for the string like cast spell. And it will pretty much instantly take you to where, you know, the code is that cast spells. Uh, so I'm going to go through a mic. I was going to add one more thing on, on the Lua thing is that the, the, that makes reverse engineering the game incredibly easy. Um, you can, what you can do is you can create a Lua script to do what you want, you know, as a test harness, if, you know, to show the spell ID that a unit is casting, uh, make sure it works, and then you can just load up the game, drop your breakpoint right where the Lua is, hit your test code, step right through it, it's just right there on a platter. Yeah, script engines can make things definitely easy mode, reverse engineering. There's really no, no technical challenge there. So a brief history. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these things pretty quick. So Ultima Online was probably the first major MMO. I think they had around 225,000 users at peak, which is, I guess, pretty chump change compared to World of Warcraft and, I guess, even some of the Facebook apps that have, like, 30 million people. Anybody play, like, Farmville? No? Okay. Good. I, I don't believe you guys. So Ultima Online, like, w p uh, hackers had a heyday. I mean, dupes, the cheats, the uh, people, you know, see invisible people, walk through walls, etc. cetera. Uh, World of Warcraft, I think, definitely deserves a mention here as, you know, it was the first, like, super big one that had millions of people. Uh, it's not so big compared to some other ones anymore, but it's still pretty big. Uh, Chinese games are massive compared to, wow, if anybody knows. Yeah, you got to do is no Chinese, you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. So the thing about Blizzard, though, is they do more than send just cease and desists. Mike can attest to that. Most other places <laughs> just sent cease and desists. 
Right, right. Actually, Blizzard doesn't, well, sometimes they don't send a C and D at all. They just show up. Like, yeah, we're a lawyer, we, here's a draft complaint, sign this paper and cut off your thumb, or we're filing this. Uh, that, that's how they work. But uh, World of Warcraft is a big game. There, there's so much money there that even if you're only getting 1% market penetration, it's worth the risk, because uh, it is a risk. But uh, if you're going to take a risk, it's got to be for a big enough game where you have you know, some kind of profit base. I'd like to add, sometimes Blizzard will show up on your doorstep, and if you don't happen to have a brother who's in the Polish Mafia to chase them out with a baseball bat, then you're going to end up like Mike. That really happened, by the way. It did really happen. <laughs> yes. So, uh, also a little bit, uh, Mike, even if, uh, even if your game is really small, you can still make a couple of grand a month, which for a lot of people is, is worth it, especially Eastern Europe, South America. A couple of grand a month is still living like a king. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you just get into it to make, you know, a thousand bucks a month, that's where I started, and I thought, hey, this is, you know, this is a mortgage. And yeah, definitely. Car payment. Depends on the car. Yeah. So I mentioned EVE, Dark Falls. So EVE was, I think, the, the first game to... Sorry about the slides. The first game to actually use a commodity uh, script engine. I think they were out before, before uh, World of Warcraft. Um, you know, the decompiled source of EVE was released. Uh, I mentioned Darkfall because it's pretty massive, half a million lines of code. Age of Conan, I, I think it was a big flop. I think a lot of people were excited about it, but the interesting thing here is they left a lot of debug strings. So I wrote a script that uh, would search IDA for something like class name, colon, colon, method name, and then I would uh, have, I, uh, have my IDA script rename all of the functions in, in my IDB with you know, this string, so that made it also pretty easy mode. Then you have something like Ion who tries to step up you know, the, the barrier to entry for game hacking, but they, uh, they failed pretty miserably. So GameGuard is actually a pretty formidable foe, so is Tomita. But if you don't use any of the advanced features of either of these things, then it's actually still pretty easy to bypass them. With Ion, you could you know, just jump, uh, patch out a call and make it return one, and then you defeated their patch guard. Or their, not their patch guard, their game guard, sorry. Uh, so this is some you know, brief overview of like, the types of hacks or exploits that have been in games you know, that have been released. Vanguard pretty much sucked. I think Microsoft wasted $50 million on that pile of crap. <laughs> and I guess that's why they've canceled like three more MMOs. Uh, they're probably afraid. So it's like superpowers, speed hacks have been around in every game imaginable. They're you know, still available if you know how to do them in World of Warcraft, for example, for anybody who's interested. I'll be in the QA room. Uh, 2D games like like UO or Ultima Online have solved this, but 3D games, the, the, it's really CPU intensive to track the movement of like 20, 30,000 people. So they still really haven't done that great of a job. Yeah, they just trust the client. We all know how smart that is. Yeah, yeah, we should. Anyways, if anybody here trusts the client, then you should probably leave. So dupes are like what the Federal Reserve does when they go to the treasury, they're like, hey, can you print me a million billion dollars? I promise we'll have the American people pay it back. Uh, but yeah, that's really how you get, how you get rich. Uh, I've got a friend who, uh, who did some hacks and was making you know, close to a million a month. He, at one point, had two Lambos, a uh, twin turbo Gallardo, and a Mercer Argo. And now he's stuck with just a lime green Guillardo. I mean, I feel sorry for him. Hey, one thing on dupes before, before you go is th this is a, a good display of, of just some of the tinkering. Like, figuring out how to duplicate an object is very much a non-technical thing. Um, it really comes down to finding, like, an edge condition that the game developers didn't think of. Um, that's how historically they've, they've all been done. So it's not some guy, you know, writing a clever piece of code. It's, it's somebody doing something weird. Like, uh, you know, maybe you're in World of Warcraft and you're crafting an item. And while you're casting the craft, you trade one of the ingredients and another player summons you. You know, all these weird conditions that the developer may not have thought of. 
that's typically how you wind up with a dupe, where you either you do something that they didn't think of, or you can crash like a, a world server. So I could give you know Josh my sort of epic ass pounding, and then I crash Please the game don't. server. So my character never got saved, and then when I log back in, I still have it. Um, but but the the point is that this is really just tinkering, which all you guys know how to do, whether you're you know pro reversers or not. It's really just tinkering and, and thinking outside the box. When you see the game, you see it zone or you see a pause, and you think, well, what if I'm in the middle of doing something at that time? Uh, the more mature games, uh, they're harder to find, but it really just does come down to tinkering. I'd like to add, this isn't like real world security research where you find like some bug in in uh, like. Adobe, and then you spend three weeks figuring out how to exploit it and, and you know, bypass ASLR in depth. This isn't like that. This is, hmm, I wonder if they check, you know, whether or not I can substitute an ID with, you know, some other random player's ID, or whether I can tell them that I just bought a million billion things for free. Yeah, so just a bunch of tinkering. So I'm going to talk about some, I guess, more detailed uh, methods of, of hacking. So like what you would try to do to, say, write a teleport, et cetera. I'll go over these things in the next few slides. So basically for a teleport hack, uh, you look for the player's position in memory, and then you use your memory editor and change that value. And if you're lucky, then you teleport. It's really complex. <laughs> uh, yeah, not really. Or you get banned, yeah. yeah. Or you get banned or disconnected, yeah. <laughs> That's in an old game when they've realized that, oh, hey, wait, people are going to do that? It's actually really surprising at how naive a lot of game developers are. They generally don't have any clue about how to write you know, a game that's hard to hack. So uh, you can go into more difficult ways. You know, If your game is more mature, like. World of Warcraft that's had to deal with this stuff for, I guess, seven years and they still haven't done it correctly, then uh, you have to modify like movement packets and, you know, forge the, you know, the timing, stuff like that. Yeah, the timestamp. It gets more complex, but you know, it's still doable. Uh, speed hacks, again, you can get these off the shelf that will work with every game. And if you're lucky, then it still works with your game. And I don't know what squeezing network code means. I didn't write that. <laughs> Sorry. That's mine. Well, I, I, that's actually just what I was talking about with lag hacks. Um, and this still works in World of Warcraft. This works in every game today. Um, where you can literally unplug your Ethernet cable, move around in the game a little bit, and if you plug it back in before the network stack decides the TCP connection's dead, then the game client will simply tell the server, oh, here's where I am. Um, it's, you know, dealing with their congestion code. They have to accept some latency. So in a lot of situations, you can pull out your Ethernet cable, walk past a monster, and all the logic to have the monster hit you is on the server side. Of course, the server doesn't see you near the monster. And then you plug your Ethernet cable back in. Good to go. You pass the monster without triggering anything. Um, don't try it on wireless, because when you disable it, it will actually close the TCP connection. But if you can physically interrupt it just by pulling the cable, it actually works. It's, it's ghetto, but it, it works great. That's, that's pretty high tech, dog. Seriously. <laughs> Dude, that's kind of lame. Yeah, there, I think you're going to mention this, but there, there, that was used to get a lot of chests in various dungeons. You know, the, in World of Warcraft, there are the five-man dungeons, and you could kind of eke your way along deep into a dungeon just by lag hacking past the monsters to get to a chest. And then you just loot the chest and ooh, exit instance and money. You're uh, lead, dude. And that's why there are no more chests and in instances anymore. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I know who's responsible for that. Uh, so dupes, anybody don't, don't know what a dupe is? Basically you duplicate something and you get a million billion of it or something like that. Uh, basically uh, this is like the key to making a lot of money and this is how my friend with, you know, my poor friend with the Lamborghinis, this is how he got them. And it took, you know, the game that he was you know, targeting like almost a year before they figured out how to deal with this stuff. They're like, hmm, I think we have a problem in that, you know, gold is really available to everybody now. Nobody has to work for it. I wonder what happened. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. 
Yeah, like I said, these you know, game developers are pretty naive. They're like, wow, these guys are good at playing my game. <laughs> so a, a lot of games have like multiple servers and things like that. So uh, you just try to you know, go things, do things back and forth and hope that if you do it fast enough, maybe sometimes the, the server will lose track of your items and they magically start filling up in your backpack. Or like in a game where if you can die and like your items go on your corpse, you, uh, you have your friend go loot your corpse before, you know, he, uh, before uh, you know, his character is saved and then uh, you know, magically when you guys both log in the server up, you each have your items. Uh, these are pretty basic, like we said, tinkering. Sometimes there's no skill involved or maybe just really a lot of creativity. You don't necessarily have to you know, be a god reverse engineer, but it definitely helps. Uh, uh, integer overflow and underflow things are also really awesome. You can get from like zero to uh, unsigned int max pretty easily, and that's a pretty big number. Yeah, and that just comes down to tinkering too, where you, you might take your armor on and off and notice that one of your stats isn't going back the way it should. And these things happen in World of Warcraft. We'd have a guy sitting in Orgrimmar taking his helmet on and off a hundred times and then all of a sudden he's got, you know, two to the thirty second minus one strength. Yeah. And it really did happen. <laughs> or maybe he just used like a memory editor and took a screenshot. You're right, yeah. And tried to sell his account, but yeah. Uh, my favorite is like GM mode. The uh, co uh, company will ship their game out with you know the the ability to uh, you know reverse engineer and flip a bit. And now you're like a GM. You can teleport to people. You can kill things. You got like the commands and whatnot. It's pretty interesting. Or like stealing from NPCs. Uh, Age of Conan was one that was really rife with with vulnerabilities. You could, for example, kill a GM. I don't think they were very happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that was the, uh, the, the source player ID thing, right? Yeah, yeah, you just, you know, yeah, tell the game that, yeah, I'm this GM and I just died. Right, yeah, like each, each packet coming up, like you would say, you know, I'm going to sell this item. And, and your player ID was in there, like, kind of like a source address. And somehow the game server would believe you if you said you were someone else. You're like, no, I'm so-and-so and I'm selling this. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and it's, yeah. that's just basic tinkering. Yeah, did I say that game developers are naive? I mean, they work hard, but... So UI hacks are pretty much worthless unless you want to zoom out really far. That's pretty much what you're going to get from UI hacks. Maybe you can get, uh, like, ghost mode where you can fly around the world and you're, you stay still, but it's not very beneficial. Well, yeah, you can also do the, the wild language translation because they had the thing where alliance players couldn't understand what horde players were saying. So but that was all client side. So the actual text from the opposing player was sent to the client. It would just choose not to display it. So it, it's actually a pretty easy hack to see it, but it's not really marketable. <laughs> I don't know who's going to pay for that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, good luck selling that, but it's not very powerful. Wow, you can talk to humans if you're an orc. Ooh. I'm in your base killing your mans. It's dudes. Dudes? No, it's man's. It's man's. I'll look it up later. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I really don't care. I, I know, you know. So uh, this is, I guess I'm going to tell you exactly how to write a teleport hack, so. Okay. I didn't hear you, whoever that was. Uh, so the easy way to do a teleport hack is you're going to have to, like, find the player position in memory. Use write process memory uh, to overwrite that, and then you'll teleport. I pretty much said that again, so this kind of repeat. Uh, you can also, if you know, like in the code where uh, where you know it's responsible for updating your player's location, you can call that directly with some functions. Uh, is there a teleport spell? You know, maybe maybe uh, uh, there's a Lua function called you know cast spell, and it takes some parameters like. Your, the location you want to teleport to, and the server doesn't verify that you are a, you know, a mage, and you're a warrior, and you just cast a spell. All right, that's, that's basic tinkering. It's, it's not going to work today, but 
that kind of stuff is out there and poking and prodding at it is, is actually pretty fun to find. Yes, it definitely worked in, in some games. Uh, the hard way is when you actually have to get down to forging movement packets. And this takes, you have to do some math and, you know, figure out, you know, how they're sending the updates. You have to reverse engineer, you know, the, the structures for their movement packets and maybe adjust the, the timestamp and so that you can teleport or run faster. Uh, logic attack, uh, this is what we were talking about in, Conan thing, yeah. in Age of Conan. Uh, you could give fall damage to anything in the in the game, and that's how you killed a GM. You gave told him that he you know just had a million fall damage, and he would die. That was funny. Uh, so this could also be used maliciously in Age of Conan, in that you could force somebody else to trade with you, and they wouldn't really know that they just traded with you. Uh, but you could also force an NPC to trade with you, so it was still useful and not mean. So I don't feel bad stealing from computer characters. I don't think any of you guys should either. They're, they're just digital tears. They're, they're fine. Yeah. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so item dupes, basically you exploit. I you know, talked about this before. I'll say that server line issues, you know, Age of Conan had some zoning. EverQuest had zoning. Uh, Final Fantasy XI had zoning, Ultima Online just had these server lines where if you cast a spell on one side and cross the server line you, and you were fighting somebody, then you were fucked. Uh, repetition attacks, I talked about you just basically move things back and forth from, say, a trade window to your backpack a thousand times a second. I mean, most people should do that, right? <laughs> By hand. Um, yeah, and the server eventually loses track of stuff and they start filling up in your backpack. Or maybe everybody knows like Diablo 1 where you just drop an item on the ground, you run up to it, I see some head knobs and you pick the item up really quickly on your cursor and it appears in your backpack and on your cursor. So that's pretty fun. Uh, asset hacking I mentioned uh, is definitely not worth it unless somebody else has published their work for you and you can borrow it. Uh, but yeah, so basically what you do here, maybe some people have played World of Warcraft and somebody has magically appeared on your side. Uh, what's that called? It's Battleground. Yeah. Battleground. <laughs> I never actually played World of Warcraft. I'd, yeah, too boring. I'd much rather bought it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should have bought Glider. Uh, but yeah, so... So those people either use teleports to go from one side of the battleground to the, you know, to the enemy's base, and you know, he's in your base killing your mans. Pretty confident it's mans. <coughs> I'm never wrong. Uh, or maybe he used you know, Nogget and modified the map to uh, you know, have this tunnel so that he could run under, underground and nobody would know or see him. Maybe you could see his little his little name on the screen or a dot on the screen as he's running there and you're like, wow, where is he? Yeah. But otherwise it's not worth it. They're really complex. Uh, game hacking 420. Uh, real profit is definitely dangerous. A quote from Machiavelli. Uh, you can get sued. I think. Yeah. So you can have a ghetto bot. I think somebody talked about one last a couple years ago. I wanted to punch him. It wasn't very interesting. Uh, basically, you do pixel reading or something with like AutoIt, and there's really no RE uh, reverse engineering required. You just like read that your hit points are red when they're full, and they're not red when they're when you're dying, and you make it send some keystrokes. Uh, it's very limited scope but most likely you're not going to get detected and detection is something that is not your friend. Actually, real quick, does, just by show of hands, does anybody know why detection is so bad? I mean, you all understand this, right? I, I don't want to gloss over client-side detection. Everybody appears very wise in regards to detection. We, don't, we don't really care what you say. Okay, we can't no, really I, I heard you. that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll care. I'll, I'll go over just real quick. Um, obviously, the game manufacturers don't like everything we're talking about, um, hence the lawsuits. Uh, 
so what they do is they try to detect your software in the game, and if they do, then they ban you. Um, if you're just doing this for fun, it's you know hacking around, t you know tinkering. You lose your game account. It's not a big deal. If you have a hundred thousand customers, uh, that is a big deal because then all your customers are banned, and then you're fucked. So avoiding detection is really important. Well, we're going to get into that a lot more later, but uh, client-side detection of your software is very important. Yeah. Also, I'll I'll say, is, does anybody ever wonder why you know? It takes like three months for a ban wave to happen. And that's because when, when you ban like 50,000 accounts every week, then those people who are rebuying those 50,000 accounts never actually rebuy them again because it gets expensive. But if you do it every three months or every four months, they will actually go buy the accounts back. So it's actually you know, profitable for you know, the game company to say, oh, hey, let's, you know, we've detected these guys ever since they, you know, turned on glider, but we're not going to detect them yet because we know that if we ban them too soon, they won't give us 50 more dollars. That's true. Um, so we've got some code injection. It's basically you inject some assembly code to do some small thing like maybe some crappy RPC thing, uh, remote procedure call. Uh, your attack surface is a little bit higher. Uh, I mean, you can really easily detect that, and then you have something like DLL injection, where you've got some pretty big blob of uh, blob of code written in a high-level language, like C or C++, uh, and it's really easy to detect that. And so you get into this game where now you write this, you know, DLL loader that fixes all your imports and stuff like that, and it gets really complex, and you're still pretty easy to detect. Or you can go to the network or packet level uh, and do some really good work, like reverse engineering the network protocol, which is very time consuming. I think there are very few games, well, maybe there's a lot of games that have complete uh, uh, you know, analysis on this. But it's still not easy to do. Uh, or you can go write your custom client if you think that you're really good. Not many people think that they're that good. Uh, it takes a lot of time. But so, he thinks he's that good. That guy does? <laughs> oh. oh, the guy leaving? Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, damn. I didn't think I was that boring. Sorry, guys. Uh, but if you write a custom client, if you're at that level, then you're probably going to make a lot of money. Like the guys that destroyed me, I think we're probably making at least a couple hundred grand a month. Right, and writing a custom client is, isn't something you're going to sell. This is, you know, gold farming, real money transactions. So you're writing a custom client so that you can have your partner run 10 million instances of the game on a server farm. Um, if you don't have a custom client, that's way too much 3D rendering. But if you can just take the game out of the equation, uh, just don't render anything. Yeah. Um, so it's all a matter of scale for gold farming at this point. Yeah, you go from like two or three clients per computer to two or three hundred. So it's pretty big scaling. Uh, here's where we get into some anti-cheat stuff. Anti -cheat. Uh, this stuff gets difficult sometimes. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that it's very important to not be detected, as then you lose. All right, yeah. Um, what I want to talk about on this is not so much the technical aspects of detection, but how you approach this strategically. Um, this isn't in the book on MMO hacking. I think there's a book. There is yeah, a book, one of right? my friends wrote it. Yeah, I think it was written by the guy that was eliminated by Warden first. Something like that. Um, so this, this isn't in the book. But strategically, what you're looking at is you have two main things to worry about with your software. You have the attack surface, which is how hard your software is to detect. And that's going to work in a couple ways because it also is going to make detection code bigger. Secondarily, you have what I'm just calling intelligence, which is how much of what they're doing that you know. How good is your understanding of their detection code? Because it's very important. If you don't know what they're doing, if you don't know how any of it works, how are you going to keep from being detected? Um, and they work together such that if your attack surface is very big, it's going to be really hard to tell what they're doing because the effort that they have to take is so minimal. If they can write one line of code to detect your, your bot, you know, you're never going to find it when they do. 
Oh, hey, don't show that code yet. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm real close though. Um, the, other, the only other thing with a tax service is that of course that's a constraint on your features. So when you think of something really cool like I'm going to have my bot, you know, uh, react within two milliseconds every time a monster does something, uh, you might be setting yourself up for some detection. So that's a decision you have to make when you're choosing your features and handling what your customers are asking for is, you know, do I want to risk increasing my attack surface by adding this? Not yet, not yet. Uh, okay. so, yeah, so before the next slide, I want to talk about uh, something that happened uh, with me and another software developer with World of Warcraft. Um, this guy, we'll call him, we'll call the software um, Inner Space, because that's what it was. Uh, yes. Uh, it worked by injecting a DLL into the game, which is pretty big. Um, but the guy that wrote it is a very competent reverse engineer. So he had taken all of Blizzard's detection code in Warden and he had it wired up. As soon as they sent it down, he'd lay down a million breakpoints and it was pretty neat stuff. But he still had a DLL in memory, which he tried to obfuscate. And more importantly, he had to patch one of Blizzard's functions. So, you know, he'd go to the beginning of the function and just stick a far jump in there and he's think, well, I got Warden covered, so they're not going to find it. Are you ready for the code yet? Okay, I'm ready for the code. All right. <laughs> can, can you zoom on just like the top function? I'm trying. There we go. Uh, yeah, oop. Oh, you had a pretty, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> wow, dude. Look, we all have that fixation, right? That's, I think some of us do. All right, so th this is an example. This is a piece of code that would be inside the game. Um, this is not actually from World of Warcraft because... He's being sued by Blizzard. Right, I don't think it would be a good idea to post that. And, you know, I would just be posting a dead listing from Ida, and it's, that's not fun to look at. So we're looking at a piece of code here that the game uses to request, say, your buddies list. And uh, as you can see, it has a parameter, optional parameter we never used before. And it takes, like, a packet number, you know, the command number, uh, we'll B O B. Hey, what are you going to do? Um, sticks that optional parameter in there, sends it up to the server. Pretty simple stuff. So the way that code used to get called, now scroll down a little bit to the two line comment, is you can see where it says old code. Uh, ask for buddies list, just passing zero for the optional parameter we never used before. So one day Blizzard says, you know what, we're going to get this guy, we're going to find his patched function. And they changed that call to the little sample code there. Well, this is again slightly paraphrased. Um, they, you know, load up a register and then do some math on it so that Ida won't see another reference to that function. Then they reach into their, uh, the function that's being patched, pull the first byte of their own code, and send that as the optional parameter we never used before. So what this is doing is just sending up one byte of their own code every time they make that request. And of course on the server side, they just comb through it, find the E9, gone. What's interesting is in the software here, you don't see anything like a, an if this guy is a bot, then tell the server. You just see, ah, we'll just grab this byte and send it up. And it's a tiny piece of code and it doesn't even change the underlying network code. There's, there's no new parameter, there's no new nothing else. The only way you would find this is if you were somehow watching that that data going out and say, oh, well, it used to always be zero, now it's, ooh, it's E9, that can't be good, <laughs> that's a far jump. So when they did this, uh, he lost all his customers. You know, they waited a few weeks, banned them all. And yeah, I don't know for sure because Lax hated me, but I'm pretty confident he lost a pretty hefty chunk of change. Well, yeah, I don't know how he did business-wise. Hopefully he did okay. Um, but they, they did this, they just hammered him again and again with this. And I found this way after the fact. And I, as far as I can tell, he never found it. But it, it's a good explanation of how much your attack surface matters. I mean, patching one function turned into this. All right, now I'm ready for the next slide. That's it for the code. Um, the point is that you, if you think you know where all the detection code is, there's always a chance it's not where you think it is. And in the case with Blizzard, they had never put detection code outside of Warden. They kept everything in this nice bucket, you know, hide from me in Warden, and then they wised up and said, we'll just stick a little, you know, a little tiny code here, pow. So it's incredibly important, A, to stay hard to detect, because if they had, you know, if they had to make a new kernel call or something to detect him, maybe he's running a private API monitor, not that I ever did that, and he would see a new kernel call. But because they can just get him with one move, poof. So 
it's really important to stay small and it's really important to keep an eye on what they're doing. You know, building tools to monitor their systems, building tools to monitor what the data stream is supposed to look like and then if it smells funny, uh, maybe you have a problem. Uh, with Glider, we actually had tools that would page us. So I would, you know, if Warden updated and that, you know, it didn't look good, it would actually page me. So, you know, Warden's supposed to have eight entry points. Oh, now it's got nine in the V table. It would page me and I'd run down to the office and freak out. When he's wasted. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can always just turn off Glider. Uh, I'm too drunk to fix it. Glider's off for a while. You know. So there's always a way out. But uh, it does come down to you can't be lazy. If, you know, again, I'm talking from the profit angle, not the fun angle. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it pays off. Yeah. I think we've both had a couple of like all nighters, 36 hour <laughs> shifts trying to find out what they're doing. Oh, yeah, there's the Rick roll too, but I'll save that. Oh, yeah, definitely. You got you to tell them about the Rick roll. <laughs> yeah, you can do it now. All right, I'll, I'll, I won't try not to bore you guys too much. Uh, at one point, Blizzard updated Warden and they added a new scan. And the way the scan worked is it would take an encrypted string inside Warden, get a key from the server, it would decrypt the string and then it would call a uh, get proc address on kernel 32. If I'm losing you, don't worry, it gets funny. Um, and they would take whatever that string was and if it resolved to a function, you know, the get proc adder liked, they would just call it with no parameters. So I was looking at this code and, you know, the game is down for a patch so I can't see, I don't have the key to see what it's going to decrypt to. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, what, what are they going to do? They're just going to call one kernel call, one, something in kernel 32 with no parameters what's the point? And of course if, you know, if the get proc adder fails then it just does nothing. So I, I sat there looking at it for hours and I was talking to uh, the Hellgate London smart guy and we couldn't figure it out. So I'm like, well, let's just bring it up. So, you know, we bring it up, stick some breakpoints in and they send the key down right away. I'm like, oh, here's the key. Let's see what the string is. So you see it, you know, it, it decrypts it and it's a URL. And I'm like, what? It's, and it's a, it's a YouTube URL. All right? So they pass the YouTube URL to get proc adder proc adder says no and nothing happens. So I, of course I'm like I gotta know. So I paste it in a browser and it's fucking Rickroll. <laughs> like they Rickrolled me and I don't know how many people they got. Not many. Oh, yeah. we're at five? Yeah, bro. I Man. think you got worked up pretty we're hard. We're almost done. Anyway, th th yeah, that was epic, you know, it, and it was really well done. So that's all I got to say. That, that is the most epic Rickroll ever. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we are pretty much done, aren't we? Uh, I don't know if we're going to make it through in five minutes, though, but uh, we'll try. So I'll go quick. So there are some client-side things that can be pretty powerful. They can use uh, packers like Thamina, obfusc ob uh, obfus I won't say that word. Obfuscation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dudes. Yeah. The, the biggest thing that you have to worry about if you're really, you know, professional in this is server-side data mining. So they can, uh, some analyst at Blizzard gave us a really big uh, bone and was like, hey, man, this is how I detect people. I just write some SQL queries and I walk in the next morning and I ban people. And we're like, well, thanks for telling us that. I mean, now we can modify our stuff. But uh, I don't think he realized that. I think he was just trying to be cool. <coughs> uh, so you have things like that are both client and server side. And basically what these things are are like command and control things that botnets use. Uh, you send your game client, in this case 10 million World of Warcraft customers, this blob of code that they're going to execute and trust on their machine. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is like a, a botnet and malware to detect a bot. Yeah, it's pretty funny. A little irony there. Yes. So Punkbuster, I won't go through. Well, yeah, I'll go through this story. Oh, okay. So Punkbuster basically looked for, looked for strings to ban people. I mean, they, they could be strings or they could just be some binary data. A lot, of, a lot of the times it would be strings like a window name. And this group discovered that. And they're like, hey, I don't like this clan that always beats me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into their IRC channel and I'm going to send some strings to all of their members. And then I'm going to uh, go back in game and watch them all get banned for cheating. That worked, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, Punkbuster was like, no, no, that's not how it works. But it really worked that way. Yeah. Yeah, just skip to the all right. skip to the D3. All right. Well, this is we where you get into money. If you're not an expert by now, I hope you guys are all experts. Um, then, uh, yeah, we're going to skip this a little bit. We've got two minutes, I think. Yeah, there's one. There's one thing that that came under development before 
Yeah, oh, yeah. this one. This, this, this was released last week. This is Diablo um, this 3. This is the Diablo 3 auction house. How many of you guys have seen this news about the RMT? Yeah, a bunch of you have. There it is. That's a dollar sign. That's a dollar sign. That's Blizzard endorsing you selling items for money. So you can wire up like a third-party payment system to your Blizzard uh, Battle.net account, and you can sell that sort of epic ass pounding that you made for real money. Or you can buy gold, you can sell gold. Um, you're not going to have to compete with me because I'm done with Blizzard, but this is very interesting. Yes, very interesting. So we'd like to thank all of our friends in Poland, Germany, New Zealand, and Australia. They couldn't be here. It's really expensive for them to all fly. <laughs> They'd probably get arrested anyway. Yeah. Uh, so we've got, I guess, time for some questions maybe? No. All no? right. Well, we're going to be in the, the Q&A. Okay. Hey, thanks for so, coming out, man. Fun DEF CON.